Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Man in America. I'm your host, Seth Holhouse. So today, I'm going to be sitting down with Martin Armstrong, and I'm extremely excited about this conversation. So if you haven't heard of Martin Armstrong, I suggest you look him up because he is actually one of the most influential people in the world when it comes to global finance and economy. He is someone that literally the central banks would bring in and Martin Armstrong to consult on what's happening with currency exchanges and the overall bigger picture financial situation. He was also someone, as he'll probably tell us in the interview today, that would be vetting presidential candidates. So he vetted everybody from Trump to Bush Jr. to lots of these different candidates. They brought him in because this guy really knows what he's talking about. And even more so, he wrote an algorithm that could literally predict the rise and fall of currencies, countries, even when wars would happen. And the government wanted this algorithm so much, and he refused to give it to them out of principle, they even imprisoned him for over a decade because he would not hand over this algorithm. So there's a lot that we're going to be talking about today. I've got a whole list of questions from China and Russia and Ukraine to the dollar to the Western central banks. There's just so much to talk about, and I hope that you really enjoy this interview ahead. Uh, But before we get started, folks, make sure you're following me on Telegram and Truth Social at Man in America. Uh, You can also catch every episode as a podcast if you just want to listen. So the links to my podcast and social media are all in the description below, or just search for Man in America in your favorite podcast app, and make sure you leave us a five-star rating. It really helps me to reach more people. Also, folks, much of the world is going through a process that experts are calling de-dollarization. And I'm sure that Martin and I are going to talk about this because I know that he's talked a lot about the coming collapse of the dollar and the collapse of the Western banking system in general. Um, So what this means, though, de-dollarization is that basically the U.S. dollar is a fiat currency, meaning it isn't backed by anything of real value. The only thing that gives our dollar any value is its demand around the world, especially because it's been tied to petroleum. But now, and especially under the incompetent Biden regime, the world is losing faith in the dollar. It's very, very close to losing its status as the petrodollar and the world reserve currency, especially now that oil-producing nations are abandoning the U.S. for China and other BRICS nations. But what happens if the dollar loses that sacred status? Well, the value of our dollars, our life savings, IRAs, stocks, bank accounts could literally be wiped out in a matter of months, weeks, or even overnight. And look, I'm not a financial advisor, so please do your own research. But I believe that now more than ever, it's a good time to consider transferring at least some of your wealth into physical gold and silver. Folks, these are real world assets that have stood the test of time. They've stuck around with the rise and fall of civilizations, the collapse of currencies, they've always maintained their value. But look, I want to be really, really clear. You don't buy gold and silver to get rich. You do it to protect and preserve your wealth. There's a reason why nations like Russia are backing their currency with gold and why the elites are buying up physical gold and silver like we've never seen before. But they don't want you to know that. They want you to lose everything if the dollar collapses. And so, Now, folks, is the time to protect your financial future. And for this, I'm confident recommending Kirk Elliott, PhD. You can buy gold and silver directly, even in small amounts, shipped to your front door, or you can transfer your IRA into physical gold and silver with zero taxes or penalties. If you want to learn more about this, open up a new tab right now and go to goldwithseth.com, or you can call 720-605-3900 to speak to someone right now. Kirk Elliott's team of advisors will answer all of your questions and take care of you every step of the way. And look, Kirk is who I use. He's who my family use, my friends use. He's someone I genuinely recommend. This guy is an amazing Christian patriot, and he really wants to help protect us financially. So again, folks, that's 720-605-3900 or goldwithseth.com. All right, folks, let's go ahead and jump into this interview because I'm very excited to get started. Mr. Martin Armstrong, it is such an honor to have you here. You're somebody who has done incredible work and you've been persecuted for it, which maybe we can talk about at some point. But just what's happening in the world is really incredibly crazy, as we all know, and I'm excited to get your opinion on things. So just thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. I think the more people that understand what's going on, the better, really. So I've I've got a huge list of questions and topics. And so, I mean, we, we can kind of go wherever you want to go with it. But I would say 
the the big thing I'm looking at is as I see what's happening as a result of the war in Ukraine, the fertilizer shortages, the food shortages, as I see what's happening with the BRICS nations and their, you know, kind of emerging new currencies and how they're pulling a lot of the energy resources and financial you know, capabilities from the West over. I'm looking at what's happening in China. I'm looking at what's happening you know, in America with the recent midterm elections. And what I'm seeing is just everything seems to be destabilizing and going through a very big change. And so I know you've talked about you know, what you see you know, happening by 2032, which seems to be a key point. But I'd like just to see like, wherever you want to dive in on these topics of what, what you see happening over the next decade or so. Well, um, <clears throat> first I should say that I had, um, being an international uh, hedge fund manager, uh, I began to see how capital really moved. And uh, not just did the capital move, but then also the talent would move. Uh, for example, in the mid 80s, we were all in Geneva dealing with the OPEC money. And then Japan started rising. And then uh, all the, the top brokers that were there in, in Geneva moved and migrated to Tokyo. I, and then that became the big boom into 1989. And then uh, so the uh, computer that I developed was from that international perspective. And I realized that just as you've said, we're not uh, an island. You know, we have politicians who say, vote for me and I'll bring in, you know, unemployment down or whatever. It's all nonsense. Uh, mainly because we're all in this globally together. And uh, the United States was 70% uh, agrarian in 1850. And J.P. Morgan had to bail out the U.S. Treasury in 1896, lending $100 million in gold. We were basically bankrupt. And the United States rose simply because of World War I in Europe. So then all the capital moved here and New York emerged as the first financial capital of the world uh, after, you know, Britain lost it because of World War I. Then World War II comes. And then the U.S. ended up with 76 percent of the official world gold reserves. Uh, so that's why Brenton Woods took place and why the dollar became the reserve currency of the world. So. Those events had nothing to do with domestic politics. Uh, they were external. Yeah. And so we have to understand that we are all connected. And this war in Ukraine is affecting everything globally. Uh, so you can't just simply wage war like this. And, and our politicians are honestly, I, I don't know, I'd have to say brain dead. but um, That's being kind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they just don't. And I'm not just talking about Biden. I'm talking about in Europe. I mean, you, Trudeau in Canada. It seems like we have the worst possible crop of world leaders uh, in human history. Uh, there's nobody there with any even questions anything at, at this stage. Um, you know, the COVID lockdowns, I mean, how hard was it to understand that if you locked down the whole country, that even food would not be produced and try and and you know, and the supply chain? I mean, I had bought a a new refrigerator and it was delayed six months. And I said, "What's the problem?" They said, "Oh, well, the chips come from Thailand." You know, um, so you know, the fact that they just locked everybody down like this, showed that there was no understanding other than what's immediately in front of their nose. They don't look at any action they take and say, gee, if we do this, are there other implications? Never. Any public you know, decision made is just for what's immediately there. I mean, I've worked with governments uh, really for more than 40 years. and. Uh, 
we were <clears throat> forecasting all the currencies from the 70s. And I didn't realize that how we became the biggest in the world was, was simply, again, politics. Um, when we were going to open up an office in Geneva back uh, in the early 80s, I met with one of our clients there. And uh, we had all the biggest institutions because our, our really our reports were going out by telex. So that was overseas, it was $75 per telex. I mean, we had people paying two, $300,000 just in communication costs, you know? So that's why we ended up with the biggest institutions. Honestly, nobody else could afford it. Um, <clears throat> then fax came and that lowered the cost. Now we're emails and it's, it's free, you know, basically. Uh, but <clears throat> back then I went to lunch and, we were going to open up an office in, in, in Geneva, and I knew that there was always this anti-Americanism there and throughout Europe. And so I came up with a list of names like European advisors or whatever. I went to lunch and I, I was asking him, is, you know, what would you recommend? And he, he said to me, he says, name one European analyst. And I was embarrassed. I, I'm thinking, oh, here I am, the American arrogant you know, person, because I couldn't name any. And I said, I'm sure there are. I just don't know any. And he laughed and he says, there are none. And he says that if he's British, it's always God save the queen. If he's French, it's this. And what he explained was after World War II, you know, the currencies there were basically zero. So you're starting from scratch. So if the Deutsche Mark was up 10% against the dollar, the politician said, see, I did a good job. You know, this is proving I, you know, what I'm doing is correct. So <clears throat> consequently, there was no analyst in Europe. If you came out and said the Deutsche Mark would go down, that you were being a traitor. You know, uh, you're, it became political. Whereas here in the United States, nobody would ever stand up and say, vote for me because the dollar's up against the Mexican peso or something. Yeah. I mean, that would have been a joke. So he explained to me, he says, the reason everybody uses you because you don't care if the dollar goes up or down. Mm. I said, it's just a trade, you know. Um, so we ended up <clears throat> around the entire world. Uh, and when they were forming the G5 in 1985, you know, I was called in. And at first I thought, gee, I guess I really made it, you know, one of the top people in the world on foreign exchange. Then you get there and they say, gee, how do we save the world? Uh, oh, sorry, your 15 minutes is up next. And then they stand up with their conclusion. And then um, I be, you know, that taught me what government really was about. These people have a proposal and they've already concluded what they're going to do. They drag in some, some uh, so-called experts, pretend that they listen to them, and then they stand up and make their conclusions. Anyhow, they had nothing to do with what anybody testified about. So I had gone out of committee back then and I wrote to Reagan and I said, this is crazy. I mean, you, they were talking about forming the G5, lowering the, the value of the dollar by 40%. And I said, you people are going to cause a, a major crash in two years, which was the 87 crash. And that's what I mean. They don't look at anything. I said, you've just sold a third of the national debt to Japan. And you're now saying the dollar is going to go down by 40%. Don't you think they would sell? Oh, gee, why? You know, I mean, they have no practical understanding of anything. So we came, you know, pre when the 87 crash came, then they were, uh, they, the Brady Commission wanted to get me in and stuff. And I said, no, sorry, I'm not interested in, in your dog and pony shows. So they started lobbying friends of mine. And actually, it was Jack Schwager who, who said, Marty, if you don't do this, they're going to come take all our computers away. <laughs> you know, so because then the theory was it was it was all about uh, computer trading caused it, you know, and 
if you read the Brady Commission report at the very end, um, I at least managed to get them to prevent any uh, major attack on the private sector. Uh, and at the end of the report, they says, well, we think, so, you know, currency had something to do with it. That was the best I could get out of it, you know, uh, because you're asking them to say, gee, we formed the G5 and it was the government's fault. They're not going to say it. So at least saying, well, we think currency had something to do with it was like a major accomplishment, really. Um, and so over the years, um, because we had focused on currency and it was really highly political outside the United States, um, that's why everybody ended up using us. I mean, even in the 07 to 08 crisis, one economist in Estonia came out and said, gee, we're going to have a major recession. And they put him in jail, <laughs> you know, um, locked him up for six months. How dare you say that? Uh, so it, it's always been this um, political interference to some degree. Uh, and I guess that's been behind my reputation that I've refused to deal with these, you know, that nonsense. And, um, you know, I was, you know, quite surprised. I was giving a, a lecture, I think it was at Market Technicians in, in, uh, in Chicago, and Milton Friedman came. Uh, to listen to me. And after I was done, he, he came up and shook my hand and, and he said, this was really the best speech he's ever heard. And then uh, I was like really kind of surprised, but he had written a piece in 1953 about the floating exchange rate and how capital would move. And I'm giving a speech basically on this topic and he, stood, he, he wanted to come listen. And he says, you're basically doing what I had only dreamed of. And um, of course, Milton was you know, instrumental in the 1971 uh, collapse of, of um, Bretton Woods and, and advised Nixon on the floating exchange rate. But he had envisioned that back in 1953. Uh, and he's correct. So... I mean, all these attempts by governments to fix um, exchange rates, pegging them, um, or like the gold standard in the sense of it's always going to be thirty-five dollars, but you continue to create more more dollars. I mean, I mean, I honestly, if a third grader should figure it out with a pocket calculator, this is going to go bust, you know. Yeah. Um, and but this is what we're at now. And, and after 40 years of, of being called into all sorts of different crises around the world, um, you know, what I've found is that government is hopeless. Um, you know, I've gone in there and said, listen, if we don't do this, this system that you people are doing for borrowing year after year with no intention of ever paying anything back, I said, it's going to go bust. I said, I give you the may, maybe 20 years we got. And the response would be, yeah, okay, fine, but I might not be here in 20 years. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't get a politician to do anything for the long term. And I, I guess the way, um, from their perspective, and this is what's wrong with a republic. Um, <clears throat> They will just stand up and make whatever promise they, they need to make. And they're not looking at the long term at all. So it's like, <clears throat> I can say, vote for me. You know, I'm going to run for president. I saved your job. And you're going to look at me and say, how did I know I would have lost it? You know, it's better you lose your job. And then I say, vote for me. I'll get the guy that did it. This is the way politics really works. So there is no... <clears throat> coming on a white horse to save our our yeah. our butts here i mean this is it um like the problem is is so much bigger it, it's it's like even when trump came in in 2016 they say he's going to drain the swamp like well what's that mean because the swamp is it's almost like the whole world is run by the swamp and you, you expect one man to bring down these this gigantic corrupt you know cabal of criminals it's like well 
no, maybe, you know, even if he fixes DC, it's like what, what's happening is so much bigger than that. Well, yeah, I, Trump, I think, <clears throat> was good hearted. He understood the problems. We have, uh, <clears throat> we have a swamp and term limits. And I think probably the vast majority agreed with that, which is what really got him elected. Where he was naive was that the swamp is both sides. And <clears throat> so you had a lot of the elite Republicans immediately against him as well. And I can tell you, I was also used to be part of the vetting process uh, for president. And they would send me in to um, meet various people who wanted to run for president. And they, they said I was there to advise them on how the world economy works. But in, in truth, it, it was really me looking at them and saying, do you think he understood? You know, was there a light on? That kind of stuff. And then uh, George Bush Jr. comes up and then they say, look, we want you to go down there and meet him. I said, yeah, OK, fine. And they said, no, this one's different. I said, well, what's different? And I swear to God, they said to me, he's really stupid. I said, what? Um, which was 180 degrees from everything we were doing up to then. And I said, why would you make somebody stupid president? And they said, look, he's got the name. And <clears throat> then I was asked if I would accept uh, the position in the White House as chief economic advisor. And I said, no, I'm not interested in that. Thank you very much. But, you know, I'm not giving up my company for two years of this. And, it's, it's, and I knew Washington. I said, it's, forget it. They're going to say I advise Toyota and Mercedes against General Motors. So I'm a trader or something like that. I said, I'm not going to go through that shit. I mean, forget it. Um, but they picked all the people in the cabinet. It's not Bush. They picked Cheney. They, and they did the same thing to Trump. And I can tell you that I've been contacted again trying to get me back into politics. And they wanted me to go talk to Trump, <clears throat> talk him out of running in 2024, and to go meet DeSantis, which I did, but um, they wanted me to advise him. They said he's a better administrator. <clears throat> and I told him, I said, look, if you get me involved, I'm gonna tell DeSantis not to leave Florida. Thank you very much. Uh, and I said, cause you people are just gonna eat him for lunch. And, you know, that's what will happen. You know, um, I was there when, when Ronald Reagan was elected. And what took place in Washington kind of really, you know, th that opened my eyes a lot in the sense that they were looking at him as a problem. He was a governor. They only want people that are senators or congressmen. You know, um, you got to come from the swamp is the way they look at it. So you just look at, you know, you know, for <clears throat> uh, Trump, they pick Pence. For uh, Biden, OK, he's a member of the swamp anyhow. And then they pick, you know, Camilla, a senator. They don't want somebody that is a governor, uh, a local person, because they don't know the way it works. Yeah, that's basically it. And why I say republics are the worst is I could run for office and say, vote for me, I'll save the whales, I'll do whatever, you know, and every oh yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Then you get to Washington. There's a an introductory meeting, and then you're told, uh, we don't care about that. Uh, you will vote according to what we tell you. And so if you look closely, you'll see all these votes are down party line. So it doesn't matter what you say if you want to run for office. They want to hear women's rights, this, that. It's okay. Promise whatever you want. Um, you know, Biden basically was promising, oh, he'll make abortion a constitutional amendment. He can't. Okay. At first, it's got to get through the, the, the <clears throat> Congress and the Senate. Then the majority of the states have to vote on it. I mean, to make a constitutional amendment is, is monumental work, and it's years. 
Um, and <clears throat> I was working on Capitol Hill when we were dealing with, uh, you know, the tax reforms in the 90s. And I ended up between Bill Archer, who was a Republican chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. He supported retail sales tax from Texas. And <clears throat> the head of the Republicans was Dick Armey, also from Texas. All right. Dick was for the flat tax and Bill was for the retail sales tax. And I'm the one going back and forth between the two. And I said, look, why don't we just sit down for dinner? We, we can, you know, have a conversation together. Can't do that. Why? Well, then people will think we're compromising. So, I mean, it's, it's that petty. Yeah. And I, I, honestly, why I kind of quit was I was in Dick Army's office and he said, Marty, look, you know cycles. I can't agree to a uh, bill and retail sales tax because when the Democrats get back in, as you know, they will, we'll have both. And I looked at him and he says, without, you know, repealing the, you know, the income tax, I can't go. And I looked at him and I said, you know, Dick, you're absolutely right. And I just kind of gave up at that point. It's, so Biden saying, oh, he'll make it a constitutional amendment for abortion. I mean, that is an outright lie. He knew it. It can't be done. And the same thing with repealing the income tax. I realize you're right. We're not going to get it done. Um, and so uh, Dick would not support the retail sales tax and very practical. And um so, you know, that's what Washington's about. It, it's um, they had asked me to revise the social security system. I set it up. I said, this is how it works. OK, we people would submit their track records and we select the people that have had the best you know, long term track record in managing money. Uh, the idea was to turn it into a, into a wealth fund. And Democrats wouldn't agree. They said, well, we want to be able to change the fund managers when we get in. I said, look, this is, I don't care who he voted for. All right. I'm not going to ask that question. Um, you know, we can't make decisions on handing out money because it's a friend of yours. Uh, and but that's why Social Security is where it is and it's going to go bust. And I tried working on that and had set up the entire proposal. And it's all about what do I get out of it? Yeah. So That's basically it. you're what you're seeing is just that there's these bigger cycles and movements and the politicians just become this bread and circus show. Like they, they really don't actually change anything. They're all just focused on the immediate. And yet you have the, there's a, you know, a freight train coming down and they're arguing over what color the logs are going to be next to the train to build the station, you know, and, and while the people are laying on the tracks. So you know, in terms of, you know, kind of where we are now, I, what do you see? Because I, everything, as I mentioned in the beginning, indicates that we're, there's a major shakeup that's, you know, in the midst. And I know you've talked about whether or not we have a 2024 election is even a toss up. I mean, so it, like what I'm kind of, you know, kind of putting together is just that the, the system has become so broken um, at every level that there's really, it's almost beyond repair. And that the only thing that can happen is that the whole thing has to, kind of collapse and with with big shifts happening in the world. So, I mean, what do you what do you see happening over the next couple of years especially as it relates to the the what the BRICS nations are doing and how that's going to interact with what the western world is doing? Well, I think that <clears throat> once again, when they lowered interest rates to negative in 2014, um I warned them, this is not going to work. You're really going to destroy the bond markets, et cetera. They don't even understand. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that uh, Mario Draghi sat in a bond room just to try and observe how it worked. I mean, and then you put somebody like this in charge of the central bank. I mean, um, you might as well, you know, Take a cab driver. Oh, you look nice. Okay, I'll, I'll put you in charge of it. You know, uh, I mean, these people have zero experience. So the problem we have 
by lowering interest rates to negative in 2014. Now they just you know went back to positive this year. And you have wiped out the entire bond market of Europe. And that this is what London crisis was about. And the press doesn't explain it. But all of a sudden, you know, interest rates go up to 3%. That bond you have, which is negative, I mean, you've lost 40% if you had to sell it today. All right. You're not going to earn anything on it. And you have to compensate for what would a normal bond be uh, in order for some to sell it. So <clears throat> what happened in London was that all the life companies and pension funds, they've had it. They can't buy any more long-term debt. And particularly in a situation where you have central banks saying we have to fight inflation, we're going to be raising rates. That means every time they raise the rate, whatever bond you bought last week is now worth less. Um, so <clears throat> effectively, they ran away from the long term. And Janet Yellen uh, stood up and said, well, maybe the Treasury should be buying in the long term and swapping it with the short. Now, again, a lot of people don't understand the real structures of these things. Uh, so one guy claiming, oh, the, you know, uh, the Treasury wants to compete with the Fed and, and become a central central cent, you know, central bank. That's not true. Um, the, the Fed can create money. The Treasury can't. The, the Treasury just issues the bonds. What she's talking about is that <clears throat> the appetite for long term debt is collapsing. All right. So saying that she would buy in the long term and swap it with short term is this is the, the problem we're facing. The monetary system is collapsing. All right. Um, <clears throat> the central banks are locked into Keynesian economics. Now, wh when Keynes came up with this theory in the Great Depression, the U.S. had a balanced budget. All right. So we were the lion's share of the market, borrowing and speculating, et cetera. So at least you could say it made sense, raising interest rates to reduce our, our, our demand. However, today, government is the, is, the, is the elephant in the room. You raise the interest rates, it doesn't stop them from, from spending more. In fact, they, they only increase their, their expenditure because they have to pay the interest. So Keynesian economics completely collapses. And that's the problem. So that's where we're at right now, right? Is it yeah, starting I mean, to spiral have, out of control? You know, the this type of inflation was caused by COVID. Uh, despite, you know, Biden wants to blame Putin. That's very nice, but he wants to blame Putin for everything. You locked everybody down. That set in motion shortages. Um, you know, I got emails from farmers that had to kill 30,000 chickens because they couldn't get on the market. Uh, so you now have, you know, a, an inflation that is, is not speculative like in the 20s. This is one based upon shortages. So mm, I see. They're raising interest rates is not going to do anything other than make it worse. But under Keynesian economics, that's the only tool the central bank has. You know, so if they don't raise interest rates, then the politician blames them, uh, even though it won't work. So it, it, we're in this absolute economic nightmare um, where <clears throat> inflation is going nowhere but up into 2024, because we're dealing with shortages, then you have this climate change agenda of shutting down energy in the United States, etc. And then you, you tack on the, the sanctions they put on Russia um, and blew up the, the pipeline. I mean, you know, it's, <clears throat> they didn't even quite, I don't think understood that Russia was the biggest exporter of fertilizer. You know, it's, like I say, they they only look at what's immediately in front of their nose. And there's nobody that sits down and says, gee, if we do this, what would else happen? 
They just don't do that. So um, then the sanctions that they put on Russia are really a violation of international law. It's one thing for one country to put sanctions on another, like U.S. versus Iran. All right. When you started going after individuals and saying, oh, well, he's an oligarch and, and that basically violated international law. Now, what's the implications of that? If you're in China and you're a big investor in the United States and the United States gets in a tiff over Taiwan with China, are they going to come for your assets? Exactly. You know, so these are things they don't appreciate. You can't just rob the oligarchs of Russia without everybody else outside the country saying, hmm, wait a minute, maybe they could do that to me. Uh, so, I mean, you violated international law there. You should have just kept it between Russia and the United States or Europe or whatever. But I mean, um, this nonsense has been very serious. And again, I don't think that these politicians understand what they have done. But uh, then you have Klaus Schwab, who uh, you have to understand when he's out there really saying you'll own nothing and be happy. What he's really doing is trying to make it sound like, look, we're headed to this major collapse in world debt and sovereign debt. It's all going to default. All right. But we're going to do this for you. All right. Um, it, it's kind of like insurance. Um, you buy basically every fire insurance, accident insurance. They couldn't sell death insurance. So they just changed the name to life insurance. And then everybody wanted it. You know, death insurance, people would say, no, I'm not ready to die yet. Maybe it'd be bad luck if I bought it. Um, so call it life insurance. And then they brag about how much they have. That's what Schwab is doing. OK, this saying, oh, you know, you own nothing and be happy is making it sound I'm going to relieve you of all your debt problems. Don't yeah. worry about it, etc. When it's the government that if the government defaults, uh, they've already wiped out all the pension funds in Europe. That's what the guaranteed basic income is about. OK, it, the replacement for because they've wiped out your pension funds. Uh, so <clears throat> with their negative interest rates over there. So what you have is this, you know, guaranteed basic income to replace your pension. Um, so I think they realize if they just defaulted, they're going to have millions of people with pitchforks, you know, storming the parliaments down there. Um, so we're dealing with a collapse in the monetary system. The very ideas of everything we had, uh, they're falling apart. Uh, and as I've said, I've tried for, for decades. Look, this is going to happen. And, and I mean, I honestly, I'm not brilliant. I think any, you know, honestly, I think a third year grader with a pocket calculator could have come up with the same conclusion. It's just that these people will not react or take measure for long term. It's like, I just have to be elected next, next year. I don't care what happens after that. Um, and we're paying the price for that. Um, and, you know, people don't realize, I mean, a lot of, there was fake news throughout history. Cicero was probably the greatest fake news guy ever. And he unfortunately influenced our founding fathers. Um, they thought a republic was really good. And that's not true. Uh, when Caesar crossed the Rubicon, um, the calendar was all screwed up. Why? Because the high priest could insert the labor, you know, the, the, the extra days for leap year, et cetera. Uh, they, the, the basic calendar was the moon calendar, but they knew it wasn't correct. Um, so the politicians would just bribe them. Well, we don't want to go to election. Give us an extra two months. And the calendar got so screwed up. Uh, so when, you know, Caesar crossed the Rubicon, what should have been winter was really summer. All right. And that's why we have that, you know, he came in, he set himself up as the high priest um, and established the Julian calendar, all right, which we use today to eliminate that corruption. You can't bribe the, the high priest anymore. 
that comes to an end. But everything was like that. There wasn't anything that was hadn't been completely corrupted. Uh, and <clears throat> just look at it. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon, all the cities opened up and cheered. All right. It was the Senate that fled. All right. They all, you know, if, if they were so great, why did they flee? Why did the people, you know, cheer Caesar and not them? And they all hopped on their boats and, and fled to, to, you know, to Asia. So, you know, that was the real story of a republic. It, it, it becomes so corrupt because, you know, they can basically be bribed. You know, I go to them and say, look, you know, I need this, I need that, whatever. I mean, just, you know, if, if our congressman had to be like a NASCAR driver with a jacket with all the, the you know, the Sponsors, logos and who yeah. support, I mean, there wouldn't be enough room. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, but that's the way it really is. Yeah. It's 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 pathetic. But um, uh, I ended up in the position I, I was because I went out of committee. When I did back in 85, they said to me, you'll never be called again. And I said, who cares? All right. This is a dog and pony show. I'm uninterested in this. Anyhow, I thought you people were calling me because you really wanted serious advice you know um and but that's what i was told and they said oh you know you can be if you're a good boy you know we give you all these studies to do for for us so you can earn like you know five million dollars a year i said thanks a lot you know i can do that on my own um but that's why so you get all these advisors that are on the, the payroll of the government that just as i explained about in in europe they're never going to you know, go out of committee because they're living off of that <clears throat> money coming from Congress. Every bill that they pr present, Obamacare, whatever, you know, it goes out to somebody. They create a study. Oh, this is going to save ten trillion dollars or whatever. You know, they <clears throat> they tell you what it's supposed to say and you back into it. That, that's the way it really works. Yeah. So when I went out of committee. Um, it ended up with me being the one that they always want to come to because they know I'm going to tell them the truth. You're be honest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, even when uh, China, you know, uh, went to, to, you know, to capitalism, uh, I was called up and went over there and um, it was very interesting experience. Uh, I was taken off to this facility and they had hundreds of people in there downloading everything from the internet. And they were tracking absolutely everything, but they were not interfering like the Russians were. Um, and what I mean by that, if you know, you wanted to open up a restaurant in, in Moscow and you know, your head would be in, in the gutter over there because you're competing against another oligarch. That's just the way, you know, like 70,000 people were assassinated in a single year, you know. Um, Whereas China didn't do that. Um, the government was monitoring absolutely everything, but they were not interfering. They were trying to study how it worked. Um, and <clears throat> I was taken in and they, it was 249 varieties of tea. I never knew there were that many in China. Um, and the questions I was getting, like how could this tea say selling for a dollar be five dollars someplace else and i said well where is it coming from over here i said well naturally it's going to be the cheapest wherever you're doing it first you have community you know transportation costs and it was like oh yeah okay you know and <clears throat> then i had explained that look somebody will pay more for something if they like this one better than that so coming out of communism i i could see why it really collapsed because that tea for a dollar in one place would be five dollars, you know, would still be a dollar someplace else, even if it costs ten dollars to get it there. That's why communism doesn't work. And this whole thing about equality, et cetera, um, <clears throat> it's nonsense. Oh, wow. I also went went behind the Berlin Wall and I saw the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> 
and that has upset me to some degree about this cancel culture. Um, you, everybody has to be conforming. And uh, <clears throat> the day the Berlin Wall went up, I was with a friend. Um, a friend of mine was was a little kid back then, walking on the right side of the street with his grandmother. So he became American. But the rest of his family was trapped. So I went there with him. He wanted me to go because he heard he might be kidnapped if they found out he was really born there or whatever. Um, and we met his, you know, his cousin and she took us around town. And anybody remotely close to us, she was, oh, this is the people viewer. They take such wonderful care of us. And as soon as nobody was around, she called them every, every name in the book. <laughs> you know? um, so you, you could see what this cancel culture is is the same thing. Everybody has to be complying with what we say is supposed to be there. And that's very dangerous. Yeah. Because what is the fundamental foundation of civilization, how we advance is ingenuity. And if you're not free to think and to explore and um, imagine what, you know, what would it be like to go to the stars? And nobody's ever going to create a rocket to go there. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about, so with, with communism in China specifically, I mean, you can see that it seems like it may be on its last leg right now with, with the protests heightening, everything's really intensifying over there. Now, I know that some of your models have pointed towards China becoming, everything shifting back to China as the really the economic center of the world um, you know, over the next decade. But it's, it'd be hard to imagine that happening under the current communist system, which is, I think, very, very, very broken, to, to put it lightly. So do you see a, I mean, do you still, do you really think that things will shift back over to China as the center? And will there be a big change? What, is it going to be the same communist party now that's ruling at that point because their their objectives with the BRICS and everything is really come to fruition or do you think it's there's going to be a massive shift and a change and something new is going to be emerging no chances are that every form of government around the world uh will change in the next 10 years you mean yeah but it, it's um you're seeing the stress there in china <clears throat> but what you have to understand is that um they are in the stage of growing to freedom, whereas we're in the stage of losing our freedom. Yeah. All right. And um, <clears throat> so they're more like the United States was in the 17, you know, uh, in the 1700s. And <clears throat> the people are, uh, <clears throat> they believe in cycles. And when uh, Jinping basically says it's our time. He knows what he's talking about. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. West does not. The West, <clears throat> I mean, there is a, a an interesting book uh, called The Geog Geography of Thought. And on the first page, the, the um, Nesbitt who wrote it, he said he had a Chinese student and he said, who explained to him, we think. <clears throat> In basically in cycles, you think in a straight line. Uh, and it's so true. All our analysis, I mean, uh, COVID, why was it wrong? Oh, they took some study and they, okay, fine. Uh, it's the same thing as climate change. Oh, gee, it went up two degrees this year. So therefore, they project that out for 100 years. Oh, we're all going to die, you know. There's a cycle to things. It's up and down. Okay. That's like saying the Dow Jones went up a thousand points. All right. This month. So it's going up a thousand points every month for here on out. I mean, it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> uh, climate change, same thing. Climate has always changed. Uh, you know, ice ages, people forget about that sort of stuff. How did we get back to warming if there were no SUVs driving, you know, kids to, to school? Uh, I mean, all these things have have, <clears throat> have a cycle to them. Asia knows that. And I would say, um, being around the world, I would have to explain cycles in Europe and America. When I went to Asia, 
and never had to because they already, it was part of their religion. They understood it. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the type of government, what is going on in China is that, you know, they have, they still have retained the name Communist Party. I mean, they're not communists in any way, shape or form. I mean, communism means the government owns everything. Um, so although they have moved towards capitalism, uh, they've retained that name. Uh, why? It's maybe a, a sense of old power, something like that. Um, um, <clears throat> refusal to admit that maybe communism failed. Uh, it, you know, whatever the psychological reasoning to retaining that name is kind of hard to, you know, <clears throat> nail down specifically. Uh, but <clears throat> we have the same problem over in Russia, too. Uh, you have all this propaganda that they put out against Putin. Uh, and I mean, I just put a, a book out called the, you know, the, the seizure, the plot to seize Russia. And right here, um, it's, a, it's a it's a textbook. <laughs> <laughs> it's like well i got a hold of all the declassified documents from the clinton administration and it it shows exactly the same problem you know uh when um <clears throat> communism fell there all right there was a coup against gorbachev in 91 why? Because I, I begin right there in the front of that book and said, here's the declassified document. NATO invited Russia to join, um, which is omitted from every history book I've ever seen. Um, and I put it in there. Here it is, black and white declassified documents. And, and then it makes sense. Then you understand why the old communists staged this coup against Gorbachev. From their perspective, that's Russia surrendering to the United States. All right, so they saw it as the collapse of their government. Um, <clears throat> on the other side, you had the oligarchs led by Barisnovsky, who blackmailed Yeltsin and wanted to become the head of Russia and bring it into NATO. And so Yeltsin was <clears throat> besieged on two, two fronts. He had the oligarchs trying to steal the content, the country. Uh, and then he had the old line communist who filed a motion for impeachment to try and get rid of them so that they could reestablish the USSR. And that's why he turned to Putin. Putin was not a communist and he wasn't an oligarch. And all this nonsense, always oh, ex-KGB. Yeah, he was a low level ex-KGB guy who quit immediately in 1991. Um, he was never the head of the KGB or something like that. And all the documents, I've got the phone calls in there from Yeltsin to, to Clinton saying, you know, I selected him. It was hard to find somebody who would continue the democratic process uh, and who was not a communist and not, a, you know, an oligarch, basically. So Putin was the one in the middle. And that's why, from the Russian perspective, he was probably more like a Trump. And that his popularity was like 75 percent um, <clears throat> because they did not want to go back to communism uh, any more than China would want to go back. Um, once the people have freedom, they don't want to hand it back. All right. So um, <clears throat> with the Russia stuff, the propaganda has been, you know, it makes no sense, but like if they they create this image like somehow if you got rid of Putin then everything would be okay. Um, all the guys that are threatening nukes and stuff, like, they're the right side. You remove Putin and they're going to get control. That's what's going to happen. Even the, the head of Chetnik came out and said, you know, um, they should just nuke Kiev. And Putin came out and said, no, we were, we don't want to go in that direction. So it was Putin who's been against that, not the opposite. So I'm much more concerned that um, you do this. And I think this whole agenda um, on both sides is in part that they need war because the monetary system is collapsing. I see. It makes sense. They're looking at this as 
if we create a war, then we get to restart over again, default on all the debt, and Bretton Woods too. This is the real objective. And that's what Schwab is actually pushing. I see. Um, you have to read between the lines. Um, Schwab has actually come out and basically said that the future is ours to, to construct. He is, he is effectively a Marxist. And he thinks that government has the power and should control it. Uh, that we should not have the right to vote. We're too stupid to know what, what's good for us. Uh, so he's even said, we'll retain some of the important things of democracy, but you know, democracy's done, basically, is what he's really saying. Um, <clears throat> then you have George Soros, who's pushed this idea of one government, uh, and the UN has, since the very beginning, has always argued for that. Uh, they, they just want power. Uh, the IMF, uh, they've created their own digital coin, and they want to replace the dollar with it. Uh, so, I mean, it's all about power struggles at this so point. It's time. basically, is it that the, the elites, whatever you want to call them, the people that have most of the power, central bankers, the Klaus Schwabs, the, even the Xi Jinpings, they know, they know the cycles are real, right? And so yes. they're watching and they know that we're heading into the collapse of this entire old system, this old monetary system. And so it's not like it was their idea to collapse everything they know that the cycles are telling them everything will collapse. And so they're going to try their best to stay in control of it and end up on the other side of that as the people that then run the entire world after the collapse. But do you think, is that correct in understanding? Then the second question of that is, do you think they'll succeed? Do you think that the whole idea of the great reset and, you know, everything that they're, they're pointing to, do you think that that will succeed? Uh, no, because you can't control this. All right. <clears throat> I think Schwab, Schwab has taken that basically from our models, and I'll, I'll put it to you this way. We started our World Economic Conference in 1985. Before then, I would go off to Zurich, Toronto, different places, and we would have uh, small institutional sessions, maybe 20, 30 people in, in each area. And I remember I was in Zurich and then people were flying in from, from Canada to it. And <clears throat> it made it more interesting because you could see the capital flows in the room. And then was my client saying, why don't you just have one big one? You know, we all get together. I said, you know, that's a good idea. So I, we did that in Princeton, New Jersey in 1985. And it was, it was, very interesting. We had guys there from Saudi Arabia in the white robes and uh, Hasidic Jews from New York City came in. I mean, I remember my landlord said, what the heck is going on here? I said, well, on Monday, I tell the one group to buy and I tell the other one to sell. And then I switch it the next day and everybody's happy. <laughs> um, but it was we were we became like a, a, a private United Nations in the sense that um, so our events have been, um, you know, quite successful and, and, but they're from people from around the world. So you get to meet a whole bunch of different people and share ideas and things of that nature. Schwab copied that and started his in two years later, 1987. Ah, interesting. That's his first world economic forum. Um, so Schwab basically copied your format for your economic forum, basically, but then also used a lot of your research about cycles to then look at the future and say, okay, we have to control these cycles to put us in power. Like, let's try to use these cycles. It's like a fisherman understanding the waves, right? Understanding yeah. the tide and that the smart fisherman will know how to use that tide and play it, but they, they don't want anybody else to know about the tide, right? So they're going to use it just for their right. advantage. And so basically... So the, the the entire those globalists are thinking that they're going to use, take advantage of these cycles, take advantage of these collapsing systems to put themselves into power. But you're saying that they won't succeed in that. And can you elaborate a little more on that and why the Great Reset won't <clears throat> succeed? Um, well, I think he took that name from our forecast that 
we are headed to a great reset, but not in the sense that he's going to be able to control it. Uh, that's the 2032 where everything is going to you know, basically collapse and we're going to end up with new forms of government thereafter. Um, I would say that um, Marcus Vetter had done a movie on me, The Forecaster, which was funded by a German TV station. I think he filmed it in 14. Oh, and I then, watched it. Yeah, great, great documentary. Uh, then Schwab called Marcus and had him do one on him called The Forum. <laughs> So, I mean, it's, it's been tit for tat back and forth, you know. Schwab forever. is like your biggest fan. <laughs> Probably. I, I don't know. I mean, um, it, it's just <clears throat> he thinks that you can control it. And, and that's why I call him a Marxist, that, you know, there's just these people. And Keynes was the same kind of idea. The government has the power to control it. And that's where I disagree. Because the government I mean, can't never... control the cycles. And exactly. that's the important I mean, part. Because the cycles are, you know, are part of government. I mean, just like right now, yes, they, they are trying to, you know, I think Bitcoin was probably actually created by them covertly to get people interested in digital currencies because that's where they want to go. I mean, reason is simple. I mean, if I give you a hundred dollar bill, that's it. All right. If it, if it's a digital currency, they know where I got the hundred from and when everybody down the chain. Um, and uh, so my view, I mean, dealing with the tax reform and all that, I, I came to see their view is really that their problem is us. They would have wouldn't have these deficits if we all paid every dime in tax that they envision. All right. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, I was in Canada and a, a politician actually said that, you know, taxation is we decide how much money you should be allowed to keep. It, it's it's that attitude. Uh, I don't know if it is something that just becomes consumes you because you're in that position. But that's why I'm against term limits. You know, I mean, you, there have to be term limits there because once these people cross that line, then their self-interest is their own and always perpetuating their power. Um, so that's when you, basically what I think. And, and so when you say that by 2032, that the governments, all the governments will change, and I know that this is you know, much more hypothetical, you know, but it's it's interesting to hear your perspective on this because you're someone that I think that has a unique ability to look into the future and and, and get a lot of things right. So I that I mean, to, if I imagine a state where the entire world goes through a change in government, to me that's that's turmoil. That is is a very difficult period, and I hope it lands on the other side with something that is acceptable. But what do you see that being like? And I guess. Like for America, for instance, what do you see the next couple of years to be like here in America for just your average well, American? I think that um, the the final stage of the decline and fall of the United States <clears throat> was probably set in motion by Hillary. Uh, and what I mean by that is that she started calling anybody that voted for Trump deplorables. Um, and ever since, it's they have ended up polarizing the country. Uh, I mean, it's the first time I've ever seen it in my lifetime. Um, somebody voted Democrat or Republican. Eh, yeah, okay, fine, big deal. I mean, now it's become almost like a hatred. Yeah. Um, and when you do that, I mean, that's the same thing that Hitler and deliberately did. Yeah, he or turned Mao. one group against another. Yeah. Um, you take all this stuff about you know uh, transvestites. I just looked it up and I said, or how many? One point six million out of three hundred and some thirty million. Why? I mean, why is this even being discussed? Um, and you know, and then oh, you had to talk about it in school to kindergarten. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, I grew up with a. a uh, 
a kid has ended up being gay. We didn't know what we were talking about when we were young. I mean, when he hit puberty, okay, that was different. But when we were young, maybe he'd want to play dolls with the with the girls or something. But it was never anything, you know, dramatic that you knew, oh, he's gay or he's this. We didn't know anything about that. I mean, it was just, we were all together in the neighborhood. That was it. Um, so I, I think when you start identifying all these things, it's, it's, you know, like the bankers were seen as the problem and, oh, who owned the banks? Oh, well, that was the Jews. Uh, and then it turned into, oh, uh, Crystal Knock, oh, get all the Jews. You know, and, and this is the, I, the same thing you're, you're doing with Russians. First, it starts out with Putin. Then all of a sudden, this hatred of Putin turns into all Russians. Then you saw Czechoslovakia. Well, we'll confiscate the assets of anybody who's Russian. You know, it's the same. You know, I don't know if it's a, a fault in human na nature or what, but it, it, it once you demonize a head of state um, and you've called him a war criminal, that how can you now move to peace? Yeah. How because can you they don't want peace? Exactly. Yeah. You know, right? So um, uh, I, I think that this great reset that Schwab is talking about is what our model is saying. But he thinks that he's going to be able to control it and push it in his direction. Uh, I don't see that happening. And why and not? Mainly because the, the real failure of of communism and that sort of central control of government is that it suppresses humanity. There is no imagination. There is no, you know, evolution. There is no advancement. It's stagnation all for the purpose of retaining power. And that is unsustainable. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there, there are plenty of examples of this type of attitude. Um, I mean, it's even in, in the in the Ten Commandments, when which I find curious because here you have something written back so far, you know, thou shalt not uh, covet thy neighbor's goods. <clears throat> uh, then you go back to you know the war, the Peloponnesian War between Sparta, which was a communist state at the time. They didn't even issue coins um, in Athens, which was. Uh, they issued coins. They were the financial capital of, of the world at that time. Uh, art, you know, philosophy, everything that Sparta was against. Um, so they basically went to war. Uh, and <clears throat> so, you, you, you know, Athens basically created a problem because they defeated the Persians and then became very arrogant as the United States is today and demanded, you know, tribute from all these other smaller states, and they will protect them against the Persians in the future, you know, and that led to, to great resentment. Um, <clears throat> and we see that around the world today, a lot of resentment towards the United States. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. For the same well, reason. Yeah. And my wife is from Australia. And though there's a lot of the United States, you know, kind of Hollywood coming in as other countries, a lot of them actually looked down on the United States and thought that we were a bunch of gun-toting rednecks and gangsters. Oh. And, you know, that's because I think their perception of our country is what comes out through our fake news and through our controlled Hollywood. They don't see middle America in the way that I do or that you do. Um, and so, you know, so back to the topic of the United States and what life is like, you know, for a lot of people watching this, they're thinking, you know, a lot of people are planners. They're, they're planning their retirement. They're planning their kids going to college. And so the thought of, you know, in the next 10 years, our entire governmental system changing, as much as we all, I guess the, the most, you know, the more patriotic folks can recognize that, yeah, like it has to change. This isn't sustainable. Look at the midterms. Look at 2020. It's like, how can we place our hopes in 2024? It's like, is it really going to be a free and fair election? Probably not. Um, so for people that are looking to the future, I mean, what what do you say again? You know, like, let's just say five years out from now, what do you see life like here in America? Well, uh, they are pushing for World War Three. Um, I think you're probably going to see that from 25 on into maybe 28 period. 
something like that. Um, I mean, even if you, no matter where you look, um, <clears throat> Nixon established, you know, basically a peace with China, recognizing the one China idea. All right. Um, you know, Biden has basically just said, you know, no, we don't no longer. He's he's gone. I would say not Biden, but whoever's writing the cue cards, <laughs> um, <clears throat> they are intent upon creating war. And I don't think they realize what they have done. Um, uh, you have <clears throat> uh, pretty much the same thing as like World War Two. You have countries splitting. Uh, Nixon was brilliant in the sense that he went to China to break China and Russia apart. Biden has done everything to push them together. Um, yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> Iran. Uh, Iran is basically supplying arms to Russia for Ukraine. Uh, and Ukraine is was never a country before the USSR to begin with. All right. And what you have to understand is that, you know, I, <clears throat> the eastern part of Ukraine are all Russians, predominantly Russian. The Donbass, they're mostly Russian. They, I think the, they, 80% of, of the, the region is all Russian. Um, the right up to the river where Kiev was, that was the Russian empire of the czars. Okay. Forget the, the USSR. Uh, <clears throat> Ukraine sided with the Nazis because Hitler promised that if they did, he would give them a, their own state. Uh, so that's why you have all these Ukrainian Nazis uh, mm -hmm. part of it. And <clears throat> so as soon as the 2014 uh, revolution took place, there was an interim government put in not elected. It was stuffed in by the United States and, 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 and Europe. It was a CIA color revolution, right? Um, maybe more than that, really, not okay. just the CIA. But um, <clears throat> they instantaneously launched an attack on the Donbass. They started the, the civil war. So it was not an elected you know, uh, government that did this. And when, if you look at Zelensky, what he promised when he ran was peace with Russia and to end the civil war. All right. And he also promised to end corruption. Ukraine is the most corrupt state, at least in Europe, if not the world. And that even came from the IMF. Um, that's why all the Biden, you know, uh, corruption leads to there. Uh, Hunter was on some board in, in, in Ukraine. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, I wouldn't do business with the Ukrainian government before or even today. I mean, the first thing out of their mouth, well, you do this and then we'll give you this on the side. And I, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in that. All right. Uh, but that's just the way it is. When you, if you're dealing with Ukraine, you don't count your fingers. You have to make sure you, you still have your arm after shaking hands. Uh, it's just the way it is. It's just the, the culture there is um, very fierce. And even the mafia, um, the Italian mafia and the Russian mafia, they're afraid of the Ukrainian mafia and uh, <clears throat> Albania because, um, and Armenia, basically, because that, if, if you understand the evolution of law, uh, Athens, basically, uh, if you killed somebody in my family, I could, you know, uh, retaliation could be against anybody in your family, didn't have to be you. And it wasn't a state crime, right? The only state crimes were against the government, like, um, and or the gods, like why they put Socrates on trial. <clears throat> and, uh, common law, uh, everything disturbed the peace. So if you and I got in a fight, then we get fined because we disturbed the peace of the, of, of the king. So uh, 
from Athens and that whole region there uh, up through Macedonia, etc. The it's more of, of the Hatfields and McCoys, family feuds. So uh, the the Russian mafia was always afraid of of the rest of them. Why? Because Russian or Italian mafia, if if you mess with them, they they come and they kill you. Okay, Armenians, they come, they kill you, the wife, the kids, and the dog. Uh, it, it's a different attitude uh, in, in that area. So uh, Ukraine, you know, we've had two employees from Ukraine, one from Kiev and one from Donetsk. Uh, the one from Donetsk actually did all the translation for the forecaster for to be viewed in, in Russia. Um, the two don't even want to even talk to each other. Uh, and I'm talking this is before the war. Uh, we had a conference in in um, in Greece, and the one from Kiev would not take a connecting flight through Moscow. Uh, had to go back to Spain, from Spain to uh, to Kiev. I mean, three times the the hours. I mean, that's how the resentment and hatred uh, is just systemic there. Uh, so you, I don't see this as ever. Uh, going to be resolving right no there there, there just is not um well, and when you mention you mentioned biden pushing china into the arms of russia and vice versa you know right which you actually or pushing putin into the arms of xi um you know that that's kind of reviving a very very old pact you know the sino-soviet pact you know the original planning do you foresee as you're talking about what's happening say 2024 2025 etc with world war three um, do you think that there would ever be a chance of China and Russia together launching an attack on the United States, even kinetically on our land? Um, I mean, it could come to that if the U.S. gets that arrogant, but um, you know, Europe is taunting Russia ridiculously, uh, and, uh, and China will take Taiwan. I mean, if you're going to look at it from a, a, a strategic military, I would do both at the same time. I mean, how would the U.S. defend both areas that, you know, it's, it's going to be impossible. Then you have North Korea shooting missiles off uh, over, over Japan. Japan. Yeah. Um, and then you have uh, basically Iran. Um, you know, preparing itself for war in the Middle East. I mean, that's an old bitter war between Shiite and and, and Sunni. I mean, one believes that, uh, you know, a king is fine. The other one believes that, no, it should be a religious state. I mean, this is these things go back centuries. Um, you're not going to solve that. So you're going to see something in the Middle East because they'll know if if they occupy the United States on two other fronts, why not? It'd be fair game for them. Um, you know, there, there's just you know, I every president up to now has always sought world peace. Uh, even Henry Kissinger said he's been invited to the White House by every president except for Biden. Why? Um, you know, it it. To me, I, you know, I, I think that they believe they can use war as the cover story for the collapse in the monetary system. Yeah. They need it. They need the war. Yes. But I think they also think it won't go to nuclear. Mm. Um, that they somehow they can skirt around that. Um, but <clears throat> we're not prepared to handle conventionally on in Europe and, and Taiwan, I mean, uh, Biden says, we'll send boots on the ground and to defend Taiwan. Where? Where are they going to come from? Uh, are you going to start, you know, <clears throat> drafting seven-year-olds? What? <laughs> um, it's, I, that's why I just don't see <clears throat> who the heck is in charge of this. I mean, are they, you know, maybe, just, you know, they're just taking too much cocaine or something. I don't know. But uh, it, it's just... For the life of me, you would never do this. 
I mean, this is, you know, why they say Napoleon lost. He opened up, you know, too many fronts at the same time. Uh, you just don't do this. Uh, but <clears throat> the monetary system is collapsing. That is clearly it. Uh, <clears throat> Schwab's Great Reset, I think he is probably taken from our model and just thinks that he'll be able to control it. Um, <clears throat> but I don't see this as working out very well for them. Or You're going to end up probably with the United States splitting into separatist uh, areas. You might see the West Coast separate, the South separate in the Midwest from New England. Um, same thing in Canada, it, Alberta separating from the, from the West. This idea of centralized control and one government, one size fits all, does not work. Uh, and <clears throat> people should understand, um, when the Federal Reserve was created, it created all these branches. Why? Because the panic of 1907, uh, was seen as a regional capital flow problem. There was a, uh, the San Francisco earthquake took place in 1906, but the insurance companies were on the East Coast. So all the capital started moving, banks started failing in New York, it was a shortage of cash. So they created the Fed with regional branches and they all were independent. You can look in the old newspapers, you'll see the interest rates may be 5% one place, 4% someplace else. They deliberately did that. So to prevent that 1907 regional capital flow problem, if all the capital was leaving New York going to San Francisco, if they raise rates, then other capital will be attracted for the higher rate in New York and prevent the bank failure. That was the idea. Then when Roosevelt wanted to install his socialistic agenda, uh, not only did he want to try to uh, stack the court to make it, you know, the Supreme Court always rule in his favor, but he usurped the Federal Reserve. He brought uh, the Fed to Washington. The head of the Fed was then to be nominated by the president. But worse, all the branches were lost independence. So the interest rate was set only in Washington. Um, so <clears throat> when you have this, this is the problem economically. And it's, it's uh, you know, it has been emerging over the last few decades. And I've been pointing this out, even in Canada. Uh, they raised interest rates to fight real estate you know, speculation in Toronto. Meanwhile, commodities were at their lows and you're putting farmers and miners into bankruptcy. Um, it, it, one size does not fit all. You know, and that's basically, you know, I think women learned that a long time ago with the penny hooks. But um, <clears throat> the same thing applies to government. And, and one single interest rate does not really conform because there are four major different uh, economies in the United States from uh, <clears throat> the, the West Coast, which is tending to be more on the technical area, the South, which has been uh, more on the agricultural side. The North was always the industrial area. Uh, and the, you know, the Midwest was more from the um, cattle, grain, and, and that's why Chicago became the center for, for trading there. Uh, so there, there are different economies, just as if they're different countries. It's almost like an underlying principle that we see, whether it's happening at the level of the, the pursuit of a one world government or even across a nation, is that centralization of anything eventually collapses and returns to a system that's decentralized. And that's just, you know, like, why is it that we don't have any successful communist country right now on earth? Because they end up collapsing. The more they centralize, it just, it implodes. It goes against the nature, goes against the foundation of, I think, our world. And so I, I can, it makes sense to me, actually, that the, that there's no way they can centralize the entire world and that it just, it's bound to collapse. 
yes. I mean, this is what um, Schwab is an academic, you know, and most of the academics are enamored with Marx. Uh, that's just the way, the way it is. Um, I had gone down to Australia and at, uh, in Melbourne to the university there. And then the guy at the time had gone to Princeton. So he invited me, oh, gee, I wanted, and, and so I, I stopped there and I just showed him a report and had some charts in it. And he dropped it as if it was like uh, something from Satan. And he says, you believe in that? I said, it's just a chart of showing what the market, you know, I said, everybody in New York uses this. Oh, I, I, yeah. you know, I said, it's just a map of where you've been and where, where you're going. That's it. You know, and but it, it, it scared him, you know, technical analysis, anything of that nature. This is what academics are about. Um, Macquarie Bank had paid them to create some program and they gave me a tour of this. They took a hotel and set up all these rooms. Um, and to train people to be dealing desks uh, working in a bank. And he was, it was all closed system and he would raise interest rates. And if they didn't do what he thought they should be doing, they would flunk. I said, this is, you know, all theory. This is, you know, won't you at least use the historical database of what the Fed has done and see what they do? No, 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 no. It's, why Macquarie Bank ever paid them for that, I really have no, no clue. But um, this is what you get from the academics. Uh, <clears throat> I was shocked. I was in London, and one of the top <clears throat> uh, universities there wanted to go to lunch, and I said, sure, let's go. And they, uh, they actually asked me if I would teach there. And I was, like, really taken back. I said, no, I'm, I'm not interested in teaching. Uh, I said, why are you even asking me? <clears throat> and they said two things. One, that uh, no hedge fund manager apparently ever wants to go back and teach. I said, well, we're all into like, you know, wild and crazy times and is, is busy. Who wants to go to a room with, you know, 30 kids throwing, you know, chewing gum at them, you know? <laughs> um, <clears throat> But the other thing he said was that uh, we know what we teach doesn't work. And I said, well, that's true. I mean, Keynesian economics, all this is just nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> I said, you know, I'm, my next book is going to be on trying to do this for a textbook for them. <clears throat> I said, I would be glad to do a lecture, but I, you know, not interested in teaching. Uh, but this is it. And you're right. It's that centralized idea of controlling. And when you do that, it's just look at the, you know, there was a movie, Mr. Jones. When Russia took over all the farms, it was the farmer that knew when to plant, what to plant, how to rotate. And all of a sudden, those decisions are made by a bureaucrat like, a, you know, DMV or something. Um, and Russia lost most of its food production. So he went to Ukraine and stole all the food there. And, and that's why the Ukrainians hate Russians so much. I think it was five to seven million of them died of starvation. Um, uh, and he did that just to pretend that, that communism was working. But you can't do this. You can't have somebody deciding what to plan who has no experience whatsoever and we're back to that with politics again it, it's they have no experience whatsoever and um it, it's it's really abysmal uh and and it can't be you know <clears throat> you know i put out these forecasts for decades living through them is something different um watching you know, how we are collapsing in any intelligent form of, of government is, is quite interesting to, to say. I would never have imagined a lot of this um, cancel culture and stuff like that in America. I mean, I grew up where we're all supposed to be fair, equal, whatever. Uh, it just does not exist. So it, it's, it's interesting, but it... <clears throat> 
I mean, this is how empires, nations, and city states collapse. Yeah. Um, if that were not true, we'd also be speaking Babylonian. You know, uh, everything rises and it collapses. And, you know, it, it's unfortunately a republic is the worst possible form of government because everybody can be bribed. Yeah. Even a dictatorship can't be bribed because the guy is in charge. Yeah. All right. What else are you going to give him? Um, <clears throat> a monarch, basically the same thing. I would like to see us go to more of a, um, a direct democracy. Uh, I mean, you mentioned like the, the midterm elections. Honestly, my computing staff could have written a program in less than 30 days that everybody can vote online. You don't need all these paper ballots. I mean, if we can buy from Amazon in a secure fashion, why can't we vote? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, never in my lifetime has it taken a week to, oh, to say who won. Um, With all this being said, I know that we're kind of nearing the end of our discussion here, but do you have hope? I mean, do you think that right now, um, I mean, if we look around, it's like you see all this evil, it seems, and, and, and all the agendas, and Klaus Schwab is like this Bond villain laughing and telling us we're going to own nothing. And I mean, obviously, there's a difficult period ahead amidst this the collapse of these systems, but do you think that something better will emerge in the future, that something is, uh, that is, is something to look forward to in all this? Yes, I, I think... <clears throat> Uh, yes, we have to go through the pain in order to get to the other side. I mean, this is part of what is taking down the system, which is corrupt. Um, the system is totally unsustainable. Uh, governments <clears throat> cannot continue to borrow endlessly uh, with no intention of ever paying anything back. It's just not going to work. I mean, that undermines everybody's pensions. So it's all basically just being flushed out. Uh, that's it. We have to understand that we don't get to um, the greener pastures without this also. Yeah. Uh, we have to allow the system to uh, collapse, understand how it's collapsing, what is, is taking place so that you can survive yourself rather than being sucker punched. Gee, I never saw this coming, you know. Um, on the other side, I mean, basically what I do is I have my own grandkids, you know, I'm hoping that what comes after this will be, um, this time will go towards democracy rather than um, <clears throat> a monarchy. I don't think we're going back to that. I don't think we're, we're going to, uh, uh, per se, a dictator type ship. But so I think this time, uh, and, and it's, it's cyclical, we always move from one to the next. Uh, and even these booms in, in the markets, one time it's Japan, next time it's a commodity boom, uh, next time it'll be U.S. stock market, then it'll be, oh, the euro, everybody's going to the euro, or oh, Russia, Russia, that's great. We have this tendency to just want to invest in something, and it always turns into this bubble, but it changes from instrument to instrument as it goes, all right? It's not always the same instrument. Um, so... That's just simply the way it is. I mean, that's human nature. But I do think what we're looking at, um, I would say is probably more likely to be more of a democratic type situation, uh, particularly when you have Klaus Schwab out there deliberately trying to remove it. So I think that will be the knee jerk reaction in the opposite direction. Um, <clears throat> will the United States survive as? The land mass it is today, maybe not. Um, again, you know, if, if, even if you look at the formation of the United States, it was supposed to be states' rights, etc. And they're attacking that, you know, uh, like Biden with abortion or whatever. Some states it violates their religious beliefs. All right, other states they don't care. You can't force your religious belief on, on the ones on the opposite. That causes tension. All right. I think the Supreme Court was right. Turn it back to the states. Hey, if you want an abortion, fine. Get on a bus and go to California. All right. I mean, what's the big deal? 
you know, when you start going into people's faces and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you have to be doing it my way or whatever, then you get violence and confrontation. Um, it's supposed to be the United States that convinced all the states to join together and you will retain your rights. Uh, that's That was the promise. Uh, and the same thing in, in, in Europe. I mean, you go to Italy, it's a different culture, different uh, philosophy, different food, then, then you go to German. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just completely different. Uh, you know, it's in Europe, you, you kiss somebody on one cheek, you go to, to Switzerland, no, it's got to be two cheeks because, and then the third one, otherwise it's bad luck. And then you go to England, it's just shaking hands. I mean, uh, so it's, it's, it's different everywhere. But I, I am optimistic for what comes afterwards, uh, but we do have to go through <clears throat> the pain of tearing this down. All right. Um, my greatest fear is that we probably end up into a serious World War III because these morons um, don't understand everything that they've done. And you're not going to get China and Russia surrendering their uh, sovereignty. Um, <clears throat> I, I also knew um, Bill Crystal, who wrote the book, you know, to justify going into Iraq. Uh, and I can tell you the philosophy that was used. Um, and they're doing it again with Russia. They, they act as if this guy is a dictator. He's horrible. And if we remove them, the people will cheer and give us a ticker tape parade. It has never happened once. They said the same thing about uh, Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi. Uh, it, it's self-serving and uh, democracy, we don't even have it ourselves. So um, let's get real here. Uh, but they are using that, the same thing. Oh, if you overthrew uh, Jing in, in, in China and Putin over there, then the people would rejoice. Not true. It's just not true. Yeah. I think the people have to do it themselves and they'll, it'll be hard earned and not some, you know, giant operative. So, so Martin, it's been such a pleasure talking with you we're, we're almost approaching two hours here and I, I really appreciate your time. Um, and I think the audience is going to really enjoy this conversation. Where, where can people follow you? If, if people want to learn more about you or where would you recommend folks go? Um, go to our website, armstrongeconomics.com. Okay. Um, we believe in, uh, privacy and, and rights so you don't have to sign up or give emails or anything else and we don't sell advertising <laughs> so you'd have to keep clicking the ads off that's good actually i'll pull up here here's your website for the folks that are looking just armstrongeconomics.com um so yeah martin again thank you so much for being here do you have any final words for for the folks that are watching and listening just basically, you know, understand what we're going through. It is necessary. Uh, it is basically draining the swamp, basically, really. But the people are doing this. Um, you know, I'm concerned about, you know, you know, the politics. I think, you know, I would say the one person who was maybe absolutely correct about that was Joseph Stalin. He said, it doesn't matter who, how you vote. It's the person who counts that they, that matters. <laughs> exactly. So I think he's very correct on that. That's true. That's true. Well, thank you so much, Martin. It's been such a pleasure. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I hope this helps a lot of people, at least understanding the world and where we're going. I'm sure it will. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, I've got a very important question for you. Is Biden keeping you up at night? Are you tossing and turning, having nightmares about inflation, the Southern invasion, diesel shortages, food shortages, Hunter Biden's laptop, and the Marxist takeover of our country? Well, have I got the solution for you. 
When you invest in a set of beautiful Giza cotton sheets from MyPillow, not only will you get a good night's sleep, but you'll send a clear message to all the globalists that they can't rob you of your dreams anymore. Instead of rolling around on cheap, sweaty sheets made in a Chinese slave factory for woke companies who turn their backs on the American people, you'll rest easy knowing every one of your hard-earned dollars is supporting American jobs and American patriots like Mike Lindell and Man in America. And it's not just sheets. Mike Lindell has truly mastered the art of war and comfort, arming American patriots with slippers and pillows and even a dog bed for Barky. Because folks, even in the grips of war. Who says we can't be soft and snuggly? But wait, there's more. Just watch your liberal friends and family squirm this Christmas when you give them some cozy flannel pajamas from America's most patriotic pillow salesman. And with skyrocketing energy costs, they'll have to choose between virtue signaling or freezing. My pillow products are truly the gift that keeps on giving. Mike Lindell is sticking it to the woke companies who refuse to sell his products by cutting out the middleman and passing the savings directly to you. So head on over to MyPillow.com and save up to 66% when you use the promo code MAN. Remember that word, MAN for man in America. Or you can also call 1-800-985-8966. That's 1-800-985-8966 or MyPillow.com with promo code MAN. So folks, go get your MyPillow products today. 